five TMJ. Like I said, it's a lot of PowerPoints, but we're going to kind of go through it quickly because a lot of it just you just need to sort of read it to understand better. So you're going to be able to define and pronounce all the key terms in anatomic terms, locate and identify the landmarks of the TMJ on a diagram, skull and patient, describe the movements of the TMJ and their relationship with the muscles in the head and neck, discuss TMJ pathology and related patient care, correctly complete the review questions and activities, and integrate an understanding of the anatomy of the TMJ into clinical dental practice. So you will have a lot of patients that have TMJ problems. Some of you may have them of your own anyway. The TMJ or temporal mandibular joint is a joint on each side of the head that allows for movement of the mandible for speech and mastication. So the TMJ is, a is the actual joint. Oftentimes people say, patients will say, I have TMJ. TMJ just means the joint. Um, they're trying to get people conditioned to saying TMD or temporal mandibular disorder, meaning there's something wrong with the temporal mandibular joint, not just you have the joint. The joint is the site where to, or junction or union between two or more bones. So we've got the temporal bone and the mandible that meet together to form your TMJ. Um, the TMJ is innervated by the mandibular nerve or the, the fifth cranial trigeminal nerve. So the, when we get to nerves, you'll understand it better, but the trigeminal nerve divides into branches. So one of the branches is the mandibular branch. And so that mandibular branch is what innervates the TMJ. For most purposes now, just know that it's part of the trigeminal nerve. And they've named it trigeminal, which kind of gives you a hint. It's tri, it branches out into three different branches or divisions. Um, let's see. The, this is kind of hard to move like this. Okay, there we go. The TMJ has two sets of articulations, so it moves on both sides. There are little discs there. Um, between where the temporal bone and the mandible meet, there's a little disc in the middle and that forms the TMJ or the joint. Um, the Here's the picture of the skull, and I can show you right here on our skull. Right here is where the articular fossa, the articular fossa is the indentation where the, where the mandible sits. So it comes up like, like this. And the articular eminence, or an eminence is a rounded, There's a close-up of that picture. This is a close-up picture of the temporal bone. The temporal bone is divided into three parts and the articular fossa is marked right there. This is where the TMJ sits right here. The part of the ramus involved in the articulation is the mandibular condyle. So this is the mandibular condyle. And this is the articulating surface right here. This part, top part right here. And that's the part that goes into that little disc and moves like this. And this is what a picture of the um, what they would look like together. So if you were to take this and put it right inside the face like this. 
This is kind of how it would sit. And this is right here is the articulating surface, so it would articulate like that. And yet another picture. So there's just lots of pictures in here. That's why I said it's a long PowerPoint, but it's just lots of pictures. The fibrous joint capsule completely encloses the TMJ. So that would be this little right here. The fibrous disc of the joint or meniscus. So most of you are probably familiar with the term meniscus from your knees. You have um, the meniscus is a disc and you have them in all your joints. That's what gives it the ability to smoothly move. You can wear those those discs out. Lots of people do it on their knees, especially athletes um, might wear out the meniscus and they end up where it kind of flattens down and spills out and causes them pain or discomfort and they go in and they kind of laser that excess off, but it ultimately doesn't give you a lot of cushion anymore. Runners particularly have meniscus issues. The disc completely divides the TMJ into two compartments or synovial cavities, upper and lower. And there's a picture right here that kind of shows those cavities. And they're filled with fluid. And that's what helps to lubricate the joint or keep it moving smoothly. And again, you have synovial fluid around all of your joints. So the TMJ is not constructed any differently. So those of you who may have had more anatomy classes are probably familiar with these terms and um, know that these are just around normal joints. They're not specific to the TMJ. Um, the mandible is joined to the cranium by ligaments of the TMJ. A ligament is a band of fibrous tissue that connects bones. So you can see in this picture right here that you've got ligaments that are connecting, keeping the mandible in place. So the ligaments allow the, give it the ability to continue to move and stretch. Those ligaments also can become sore on people who are grinding or clenching or moving their jaw side to side um, or doing weird movements at night. These are your three ligaments. They're called the temporomandibular, the stylomandibular, and the spinomandibular. Those are the three ligaments and they're in the picture and they're the ones that connect the TMJ. The temporomandibular ligament is located on the lateral side or the outer side here, and that would be, um, I don't even have that one in here. The TMJ ligament prevents the excess of retraction or moving backward of the mandible. So it stops the mandible from retracting or pulling in too much. The stylomandibular ligament um, is formed from thickened cervical fascia in the area. So don't worry about that. That's not something you need to know right now. The spinomandibular ligament is not strictly considered part of the TMJ, but is located on the medial side of the mandible. So it's about right here, and you can kind of see these two ligaments that run side by side. And this stylomandibular, again, if you didn't know anything about it, it's connected from the styloid process to the mandible, stylomandibular. The spinomandibular ligament is a landmark for the administration of the IA block and is also involved in troubleshooting the injection due to its location. So we don't really use it as, um, as a landmark for us. We use the coronoid notch but it can be used as a marker. 
movements? How does your jaw move? The TMJ allows for the movement of the mandible during speech, mastication, by way of the muscles attached to, to the two bones. So the muscles move and there are nerves that are going to innervate those muscles. The nerves tell the muscles what to do, the muscles do the movement. The basic types of movement performed by the joint and its associated muscles are grind, gliding and rotational. So gliding would be to move the jaw this way, rotational this way, like that. Gliding movement of the TMJ occurs mainly between the discs and the articular eminence of the temporal bone. Um, so the gliding movement is mostly like this allows the lower jaw to move forward and backward. <coughs> Excuse me. So the jaw, if you slide your jaw, everybody slide your jaw forward and backward. That's the gliding movement. Protrusion is where the jaw goes forward like that. Um, it, it's caused by contraction of both the lateral pterygoid muscles. So remember you have medial and lateral. Bringing the lower jaw back inward involves retraction of the mandible or the contraction of the posterior parts of the temporalis muscle. So we are going, and when you study the temporalis muscle, it'll tell you what it does. The rotational movement of the TMJ occurs mainly between the disc and the mandibular condyle. So the disc and the mandibular condyle, the disc being this right here and the condyle. The axis of rotation of the disc puts the condyle in transverse and the movements accomplished are depression or elevation of the mandible. So like that. Depression of the mandible is lowering of the lower jaw. Elevation is raising of the lower jaw. So keep in mind when you're talking about the mandible and about the TMJ and about the muscles and mastication or anything like that, the mandible is the only one that moves. It does all the movement. Oops. When you chew, your head doesn't move. Your head stays still. Your mandible moves. So when you're talking about muscles, the movement is all going to be happening in the mandible, not in the, the skull itself. Um, with these two types of moving movements, gliding and rotational, and with the right and left TMJs working together, the finer movements of the jaw can be accomplished. Those include opening and closing and shifting the lower jaw from side to side. So we think about when you're doing your extra oral exams and you put your fingers right here and you're feeling and you have them open and close and you can feel the joint move and then shift from side to side and you can feel that sliding. So the muscles of mastication involved in elevating the mandible during closing of the jaw include the bilateral contractions of the masseter, temporalis, and medial pterygoid muscles. So which ones close the jaw? All of them except the lateral pterygoid. And these are just some pictures for you to look at. The lateral deviation of the mandible or lateral excursion involving shifting the lower jaw one side to the other occurs during mastication. So you don't even realize when you're chewing that your jaw is moving in all different directions. So you're not just doing like that. You're actually kind of moving in lateral direction as well. It's kind of grinding your food up. So contraction of the ipsilateral. Does anybody remember what ipsilateral means? Somebody jump in and tell me what ipsilateral. Anybody? Both so ipsilateral um, is where it, it goes across. So it would be like your right arm and your left leg, ipsilateral. So contraction of the ipsilateral lateral pterygoid muscles 
on one um, one on protruding side is involved during lateral deviation. So in other words, if you want your your jaw to shift to the right, it's going to be um, the the contraction of the lateral pterygoid muscle on the left is going to cause it to move to the right. That's kind of confusing. During mastication, the power stroke, when teeth crunch the food, involves a movement from a laterally deviated position back to the midline. So in other words, the teeth are doing this. If the food is on the right, the mandible will be deviated to the right by the left lateral pterygoid muscle. So that's what I was trying to describe. I just wasn't wording it as well as the book. So in other words, if you're chewing on your right side, your left lateral pterygoid muscle or ipsilateral muscle is going to be causing this to move. The power stroke will return the mandible to the center so that movement is to the, um, is to the left and involves a retraction of the left side. So it's going to then retract, pulling the, the mandible back. This is accomplished by the left posterior part of the temporalis muscle. So they're working together to pull the jaw back. This all happens so fast and so rhythmically when you're chewing and eating, you just take it all for granted. At the same time, all the closing jaw muscles on the right side contract to crush the food. And then you, the reverse situation happens on the left. So this is kind of an interesting slide read it over again and kind of play with it with your own teeth. Put your hands on your face to see if you can feel your muscles at all, particularly like your temporalis muscle. Feel your own joint right here. Make sure you wash your hands before you and after you do this though. Um, but feel around on your own TMJ. Get familiar with what the movements should feel like or do feel like. If you are somebody who knows your jaw pops, or you have crackling sounds or anything um, as a deviation of normal, put your fingers on it and feel it. Feel, observe what's really going on. Um, because that's going to help you when you actually touch a patient and they have the same thing going on. The position of the TMJ is not with the teeth biting together. This is important to know. The resting position is where your teeth have a little bit of open space. So if you're just sitting there resting your face, your teeth are not going to be closed together. Your teeth are going to be slightly apart. That's called freeway space. That little space is called freeway space. That, that uh, question is on, I think, the final exam and um, I, most of the time students miss it because they think that the teeth are closed when you're when you're resting your teeth is, are closed your mouth might be closed but your teeth are not biting together there's a little bit of space between your teeth and so sometime when you're also feeling your tmj practice that just relax and see your mouth is closed but your teeth are not biting together this slide just kind of summarizes some of the movements of the um, muscles of the TMJ. A patient may have pathology associated with one or mo both of the TMJs called TMD, temporomandibular disorder. Um, you can experience joint tenderness, swelling, painful muscle spasms, headaches are a common one, um, just fatigue in the joint. Patients wake up in the morning and their jaw muscles are sore because they've been clenching or grinding or moving their mouth around all night rather than resting it. And that's the TMD. So you recognize the TMD by palpating it during your exam. And this is what you guys practiced doing the other day. So you can have two different problems with your TMJ. It can be either the joint itself or the disc involved so this or this or you can just have problems with the muscles so patients oftentimes who clench or grind their teeth 
their muscles are clenched all night. And so then, um, or athletes, a lot of times when you're running, I don't know if any of you run, but your teeth, you're clenched the whole time you're running. That's not necessarily a disc or joint problem. That's more of a muscle problem. And then, so then you'll wake up and your muscles are fatigued or you get finished with your five mile run and your mouth is tired because you've been clenching the whole time. This is what a, a night guard looks like. It's the most conservative treatment for patients with um, TMD. Some of you may have these. If you don't, you're gonna be making them in dental materials next term. Um, I'm not gonna get into all the TMD stuff here. Just know that if a patient has trismus, it's the inability to normally open your mouth. This just shows them doing the exam and what you're, and then a, a little case study that you can read over that talks about TMD. So that's it pretty much for TMD. Anybody have any questions? So just kind of read over everything again. We're going to, now that we're back into our reviews, the group that goes on Wednesday, we're going to review this stuff tomorrow. We'll have the heads out. Um, we'll look at the muscles on the heads. Um, so if you want to bring your book with you, that would be helpful. Um, we'll look at all kinds of pictures and we'll identify the muscles on the heads tomorrow. So um, that should help us with and we'll also review the canines for the quiz on Thursday. The group that goes on Monday will review these muscles on Monday. Sound good? So is this like last class before the midterm? No, you have Thursday. So thir this is your last of this class. Okay. And then uh, on Thursday. Sorry, um, just well, we have head and neck anatomy and the tooth anatomy on the same type of midterm? Yes. Okay. So yes, your um, 